My name is Mark Stone. I am the Chief Information Officer for the Texas A&M University System. Today, I would like to provide you with a preview of a post-COVID world. It goes without saying that the past seven or so months have been disruptive, difficult, and unprecedented. The COVID-19 virus and measures meant to stop the spread of the virus, flatten the curve, or end the transmission of the virus has resulted worldwide in 1,126,000 deaths a decline in working hours of 12.1% or the equivalent of 345 million full-time jobs in the third quarter of 2020. It has resulted in 42 to 66 million children falling into extreme poverty, hundreds of thousands of additional child deaths, and a 1.5% drop in global economic output for the rest of this century, from the disruption to schooling in the spring. The same COVID-19 virus and several similar measures in the United States has resulted in 222,000 deaths, 10 million lost jobs, 73,000 closed businesses, and a $15.3 trillion economic loss for the rest of this century from the disruption to schooling in the spring. We could spend time in this session discussing how to encourage, manage, and protect our remote workforce, but we won't. We could spend time in this session sharing lessons learned from moving our workforce from on-site to remote locations, but we won't. We could spend time in this session sharing best practices for web conferencing, collaboration, and measuring employee performance but we won't. Rather, we're going to preview what business will look like in a post-COVID world. I will organize my thoughts around two major threads, a preview of the post-COVID world and four subjects IT executives will need to rethink. Before I begin our session, I want to set forth five COVID-related presuppositions that undergird this presentation. First, COVID-19 has been politicized. As such, we will reject the fear-mongering of the mainstream media, progressive Democrats, and tunnel-visioned epidemiologists. We will also reject libertarians, far-right conservatives, and virus skeptics that deny the risks posed by COVID-19. There are only three approaches to addressing the virus. We can fear the virus and continue to keep businesses and schools in lockdowns. We can deny the virus and implement no mitigation strategies. Or we can respect the virus and implement sustainable mitigation strategies. We will not fear or deny the virus. Rather, we will respect the virus. Second, this presentation will be based on data. It will take into consideration scientific studies, whether the conclusions of these studies fit into a particular political narrative. Third, this presentation assumes that it is not currently possible to eliminate the virus. As such, our goal should not be to eradicate the virus or end the transmission of the virus. Rather, our goal should be to contain the virus to limit its harm and to maximize the healthcare system's ability to treat both COVID patients as well as other medical needs of the community. That is, we need to adopt a sustainable strategy to coexist with the virus. More on that later. Fourth, I am not an immunologist or an epidemiologist. I am a data scientist. Fifth, I am aware that COVID-19 may be very personal for some of the attendees. Please do not take offense at anything that is stated in this presentation or assume that I'm ignoring the real stories of friends or family members that some of you may have lost during this epidemic. This presentation focuses on impersonal data. 
With those five presuppositions behind us, let us consider the first major thread of this presentation, a preview of the post-COVID world. And we will divide this thread into two sections. The post-COVID world will be different than you expect. And the post-COVID world might be here sooner than you expect. The post-COVID world will be different, but how will that post-COVID world be different than you expect? First, COVID-19 will not be going away. The time to contain the virus is past. The coronavirus is simply too widespread and too transmissible. The most likely scenario is that the pandemic ends because enough people have acquired immunity or have been vaccinated, but the virus continues to circulate in lower levels around the globe. Cases will wax and wane over time. Outbreaks will pop up here and there. COVID-19 will not be going away. Second, any vaccine will be flu-like, not smallpox-like. Any COVID-19 vaccine is likely to suppress but never completely eradicate the virus. For context, consider that vaccines exist for more than a dozen human viruses, but only one, smallpox, has ever been eradicated from the planet, and that took 15 years of immense global coordination. Rather than a one-time deal, a COVID-19 vaccine will likely in require booster shots to maintain immunity over time, much like a flu shot. Third, it is possible to exist with COVID-19. Why? We know at least five things. First, we know who is at risk. According to the CDC, only 6% of coronavirus deaths have COVID-19 as the only cause mentioned. 94% of patients who died from coronavirus also had other health conditions and contributing causes. According to the CDC, people with cancer, obesity, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, COPD, serious heart conditions, sickle cell disease, or hypertension are at increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Second, we know that we know what the infection fatality rate is by age group. Mathematically speaking, the case fatality rate is the total number of deaths divided by the total number of people that have the disease's symptoms. In contrast, the infection fatality rate is the total number of deaths divided by the total number of people that carry the infection regardless of having clinical symptoms. The problem with calculating the IFR is that we don't test everyone, and the population-wide number of infections must be estimated. The CDC has issued a COVID-19 report that contains a multiplier of 11 to extrapolate the number of reported COVID-19 cases to the infection prevalence in the general population. For COVID-19, this multiplier includes asymptomatic cases since it was based on randomized antibody testing. Using that multiplier, this chart shows that the U.S. COVID-19 IFRs and the infection survival rates by age group. You will note that the infection survival rate for those under 18 is 99.998, almost three nines. You will also note that the infection survival rate is high, 99.979, for those under 40. In fact, if you are under 30, you are more likely to be killed in a vehicle accident than die from COVID-19. That is because the annual vehicle mortality rate in the United States currently runs at about 0.011, which is almost twice that compared to the 0.0006 for COVID-19 for those under 30. Now, at least anyone accuse me of equating COVID-19 to flu, it should be noted that COVID-19 has a higher IFR than the flu. Flu has an IFR of 0.1%, and the most optimistic COVID-19 IFR estimate is 025 
making COVID-19 more than twice as deadly as the flu. Just as importantly, COVID-19 has a higher reproduction rate, 2.8 to 1.3, which is really the number of extra persons infected. So COVID-19 will infect 2.8 persons while flu will infect 1.3 extra persons. So when you combine these two facts, you can see the motivation behind our public health measures to limit the spread. COVID-19 is deadly and highly infectious. Third, we know that the young are at little risk from COVID-19. In addition to the very high infection survival rates shown earlier for the young, PreOp has created a comparison between the flu and COVID-19. This updated analysis shows that a person 25 years old or younger has a greater likelihood of dying from the flu than from COVID-19. It is also worth noting in this additional chart, utilizing deaths by age group from the CDC as of October 14th, that one has to be over 45 years old before one has a greater risk of dying from COVID than from every other cause of death combined. Fourth, we know that lockdowns aren't the right answer. Numerous studies have concluded that lockdowns did not halt the spread of the virus. That can be noted in my end notes. Lockdowns also resulted in a reduction in overall health due to delays in vaccinations, screenings, and treatments. Lockdowns decreased the availability of medical care due to staff cuts from lost elective surgery revenue. Lockdowns destroyed the future earning potential of millions of citizens due to academic disruptions that will likely never be corrected. And lockdowns closed tens of thousands of businesses that will never reopen. Worse, lockdowns will likely delay community herd resistance and acquired in immunity. Lockdowns are simply not part of an effective, sustainable COVID-19 strategy. It is worth looking at the 2020 Pandemic Misery Index created by the Private Enterprise Research Center at Texas A&M University. This index defines and measures the effectiveness of reopening and lockdown strategies followed by various states. As you will notice, states practicing sustainable mitigation strategy largely did better than states practicing lockdown-centric strategies. It is also worth note considering the US Labor of US Bureau of Labor Statistics unemployment data by state for August. The national unemployment rate, which now stands at 7.9% in September, was 8.4% in August. However, the economic pain represented by that number was not spread evenly across lockdown-centric and non-lockdown-centric states. Fueled by broader, faster economic reopenings following the initial coronavirus crash, non-lockdown-centric states are far outpacing lockdown-centric states in terms of putting people back to work. For example, nine of the 10 states with the lowest unemployment rates followed non-lockdown-centric strategies and nine of the 10 states with the highest unemployment rates followed lockdown-centric strategies. Fifth, we know that healthcare systems don't have to be overwhelmed. It is possible to reopen communities and not overwhelm one healthcare system. If one looks at Texas, you will note that Texas never approached maximum ICU capacity. At the peak of the virus outbreak, the state still had over 900 available ICU beds, not counting additional surge capacity. It had over 1,000 available ICU beds just last week, not counting additional surge capacity. One can also look at the Texas Medical Center, the world's largest medical center. At no time did TMC run out of ICU beds. In fact, if 
one looks, Texas TMC peaked at 20% of phase two intensive care. That's where that, that little red arrow is on this chart, which did not require TMC to utilize any of its additional 750 ICU bed surge capacity. And in fact, even today, only 164 patients are in ICU due to COVID, which makes up a very small percent of the total of that are in ICU beds. While it is possible for any single hospital to reach or exceed capacity, the state of Texas, using this as an example, is better prepared to handle the surge in hospitalizations if it occurs. That's because we now have adequate PPE, better treatments available for patients, and additional medical capacity that can be pivoted to hot spots across the state. Sixth, we know what strategies effectively mitigate the spread of the virus. We know that protecting the vulnerable, wearing of face coverings, frequent hand washing, social distancing, and limiting indoor group gatherings dramatically slows the spread of the virus without having to issue shelter in place orders. We also know that effective mitigation strategies allow the virus to spread to those least at risk, shortening the time required to achieve community resistance to the virus. More on this later. There is a growing consensus of this strategy as evidenced by the Great Barrington Declaration. This declaration penned by professors at Harvard, Oxford, and Stanford universities call for focused protection by letting young low-risk population carry on with their lives and naturally becoming infected while protecting those at high risk. As of last, as of today, this declaration has been signed by 563,000 concerned citizens, 11,000 medical and public health scientists, and 31,000 medical practitioners. You should be aware that some epidemiologists oppose aspects of this declaration because it calls for acquired immunity. They base their disagreement on the fact that about one third of the population is vulnerable to serious complications from COVID-19 and argue it would be impossible to protect these people who live outside of nursing homes, the elderly, the obese, and those with underlying conditions like heart disease and diabetes. But whether you embrace the great Barrington Declaration or not, we know what strategies are effective in mitigating the spread of the COVID-19 virus. I would suggest that Texas, Brazos County, and Texas A&M University demonstrate that effective mitigation strategies without lengthy or repetitive shelter in place orders slow down, I did not say eliminate, slow down the spread of the virus and are sustainable. One is not forced to implement shelter in place orders which will further damage the economy, our healthcare system, and our K through 12 schools. Effective mitigation strategies allow a community, state, and nation to coexist with COVID-19. As you can see, a post-COVID world will be different than you expect. And for some communities, it might be here sooner than you expect. It is important to understand what I mean by when I make that statement. I'm not equating a post-COVID world to a return to the world we lived in prior to COVID. I am not equating a post-COVID world to a world without COVID. See the earlier part of this presentation. I am not referring to communities that choose to follow strict but unsustainable mitigation strategies. Those communities will have to endure the inevitable spike in viruses as they try to reopen, as is being evidenced in Europe, in most states in the United States today. Rather, I am defining the post-COVID world as the new norm that will govern our lives. That new norm will be different from 2019 or 2020. Let me consider eight reasons why the post-COVID world might be here sooner 
than you expect. For the first time since the start of the X epidemic, the weekly number of excess deaths dropped below the expected number of deaths in early September and has remained below that level into early October. At the same time, the percentage of deaths attributed to pneumonia, influenza, and COVID have approached the threshold that will cause the CDC to no longer define COVID-19 as being an epidemic in the United States. Third, despite recent, the recent upsurge in COVID-19 cases, and despite widespread school reopenings in large athletic events, the number of deaths attributed to COVID are flattening for the United States and declining in Texas. One might ask, isn't there a spike in cases in most states, including Texas? The answer is yes. Yet, as noted by the New York Times on October 20th, the increase in the number of cases is not, quote unquote, in and of itself overly alarming. Why? First, the surge in cases is occurring in those age groups that are less likely to require hospitalization. Second, the US is conducting a lot more tests than in the summer or the spring. And in more widespread testing means that the official numbers are capturing a larger share of new virus cases than earlier this year. And third, as noted by the New York Times in the same article, even as the case numbers have soared and hospitalizations have risen, deaths have held fairly steady. The New York Times states that this is most likely due to the fact that the most vulnerable are being careful about avoiding exposure. Those getting ill are not at risk, and the quality of virus treatments are improving. Fourth, we know that immunity is real. The CDC recognizes that a person recovering from COVID has at least three months of immunity, and there are numerous studies that expect COVID immunity will last up to one year. We've also learned that COVID-19 immunity is linked to T cells in addition to antibodies. And roughly speaking, antibodies mop up the viruses that are floating around outside cells, while T cells kill the ones that have already worked their way inside. T cells do demolition. Antibodies do cleanup. Antibodies disappear after three months, but T cells can remain on guard in a body for 12 months or more. Fifth, we know that the upcoming flu season could be one of the mildest on record. This is based on the just completed flu season in the Southern Hemisphere, which simply never arrived. The predicted decline in the severity of the upcoming flu season in the Northern Hemisphere is attributed to the widespread coronavirus restrictions such as mask wearing, social distancing, and limitations on indoor group gatherings. The decline can also be attributed to better behavior by most citizens. For example, if one has a runny nose, a cough, or sneezing, you won't be allowed to go to work, school, or church. Sixth, we know that a vaccine is likely to arrive in 2021. There are currently seven vaccine candidates being tested in the US, three of which are expected to have enough data to determine efficacy by the end of the year. Seventh, we know that young children, those less than 10 years of age, don't effectively spread the virus. Young children simply do not shed enough COVID virus cells to infect other children, parents, or at-risk grandparents. We also know that K through 12 schools are not super spreaders. Emily Oster, an economist at Brown University, has been working with a group of data scientists at the technology company Qualtrics, as well as with school principal and superintendent associations to collect data on COVID-19 in schools. Their data on almost 250,000 kids in 47 states starting in September through mid-October 
revealed an infection rate of 0.14% among students and 0.35% among staff. That's about one infection over six weeks in a school of 1,000 kids or two and a half infections for faculty over six weeks in a group of 1,000 staff. Even in high-risk areas of the country, the student rates were well under half a percent. This fact is important because we can safely reopen K-12 through schools knowing that it will not impact the spread of the virus in the community. And finally, we know that herd immunity is probably closer for some communities than we were originally told. We've been told since the outset of the COVID outbreak that because this was a novel virus, no one would have any immunity and everyone was at risk of being infected. To achieve so-called herd immunity, the point at which the virus can no longer spread widely because there are not enough vulnerable humans, scientists have suggested that perhaps 60 to 80 percent of a given population must be immune through vaccination or because they've survived the infection. But a growing number of epidemiologists have come to believe that that early consensus of 60 to 80 percent was flawed because it assumed that everyone was equally susceptible to the virus. And it turns out that's not the case. The reason is what they call the heterogeneity of susceptibility, which holds that not everyone is equally susceptible to a disease, even if there's never been a previous exposure to a particular pathogen at issue. These scientists have noted, for example, that individuals, particularly in Asia, exposed to a large number of coronaviruses tend to be more resistant than those exposed to a smaller number of coronaviruses. Researchers have also noted that human populations are far from homogenous. Transmission and immunity are concentrated among the most active members of a population who are often younger and less vulnerable. Thus, as the active member of the population develop immunity, transmission begins to drop quickly. And when age and activity heterogeneities are introduced into these population models, herd immunity can be achieved at population-wide infection rates below 50%. The most important article I've read on the math behind COVID herd immunity can be found in Quantum Magazine. This article, a New York Times article, and others in my endnotes quote a number of studies the end notes really actually only represent a small number of the studies I've actually read, which are now estimating community herd immunity to be somewhere between 20 and 50%. This means that there's increasing evidence that some communities which have seen two or more waves of the virus may be approaching their herd immunity threshold. Now, it should be noted that even if a community is approaching its herd immunity threshold, the virus will continue to spread, but just more slowly. Citizens in those communities will continue to get sick and die. Thus, those communities should remain vigilant and maintain effective mitigation strategies until herd immunity is achieved, most likely by a vaccine. But the sooner communities, cities, states, and nation adopt sustainable mitigation strategies, strategies that allow schools, businesses, and events to remain open, rather than non-sustainable lockdown-centric strategies, that is strategies that keep schools, businesses, and events closed, the sooner it will be possible to move into a post-COVID world. Yes, a post-COVID world may require face masks on transportation. It may require de-densified classrooms and workspaces. It may end the practice of handshaking. It may require that large group gatherings like athletic events be limited to less than 100% capacity. And it may require a continuation of tight restriction on those who display COVID-like symptoms. That is, if you have a cough, runny nose, or fever, you won't be allowed at school, work, or church. But with all apologies to those experts who are predicting a third wave, or the IHME modelers who are predicting 371,000 US COVID-19 deaths by year end. We know based on proven community successes 
that the post-COVID world might be here sooner than you expect for communities that reopen and adopt sustainable mitigation strategies. That leads us to move on to our second major thread. What IT executives will be required to rethink in a post-COVID world. While we could build a laundry list of requirements, let's highlight just four. First, the post-COVID world will require IT executives to rethink shared services. The sudden move of personnel to remote alternative work locations demonstrates that services previously provided on site could be met by workers from remote locations. This sea change demonstrates amongst other things that services previously provided by internal FTEs may also be met by outsourced or shared FTEs. IT executives should take this fact into consideration. The economic fallout from COVID-19 necessitates that IT executives look at all cost saving ideas. Outsourcing or partnering with industry peers to provide shared services is a viable option. IT executives should note that reliance on software as a service based applications delivering a shared service were a consistent success during the pandemic. Not only was the performance largely outstanding, SaaS based applications transfer the risk from a conventional enterprise application model to a cloud risk model. IT executives should expect that reliance on SaaS based applications delivering a shared service will continue to grow in the post COVID world. And finally, the shortage of key IT skills will necessitate that IT executives look at outsourcing or sharing those key resources with others. Let me suggest that IT executives rethink whether they should engage shared services for customer service, commodity applications like human capital management, payroll, travel expense management. They should rethink shared services for data centers, data storage, after hours help desks, cyber monitoring, endpoint and network detection, electronic information accessibility resource coordinators, and information security officers. Let me suggest that the post COVID world will require IT executives to rethink shared services. Second, the post COVID world will require IT executives to rethink cybersecurity. The sudden move of on-site employees to remote work locations highlighted that home Wi-Fi routers and IoT devices are seldom properly secured. Most employees had never heard of a VPN and had no idea how to configure one. Many companies with a generally available VPN offering were overwhelmed by the VPN load. That is, they exceeded license counts or exceeded hardware capabilities. The companies had not implemented secure file storage in the cloud. Companies had not developed a policy on what data could only be accessed on site, and the organization's attack surface vastly increased. A remote workforce outside the boundaries of the corporate network greatly increases the risk to the endpoint as both an asset and as a vector into the corporate network. The following three measures are the best solutions to minimize that risk. IT executives need to focus more on endpoint security. This focus should include a robust endpoint protection platform product, along with a device firewall to block inbound connections and facilitate client initiated communication to management systems. This endpoint security focus should embrace a zero trust philosophy. Zero trust ensures the security of an endpoint communication to the destination service without concern for the networks being traversed, providing positive authentication of the user, device, and service while eliminating choke points such as a VPN. This endpoint security focus should include endpoint detection and monitoring. 
An endpoint detection and response tool, EDR, provides an always-on early warning of malicious processes, possibly before network-based monitoring would even detect such activity. In addition to the focus on endpoint security, IT executives should focus on offline backups. The second focus should include a time-based rather than a revision-based cloud backup model for endpoint devices. Such a backup provides an off-device copy of data, allowing IT to write off a lost or stolen device and restore the user back to operation. This offline backup focus should include a time-based rather than a revision-based backup strategy for all servers. Backup appliances should use agent-based backups of live file systems that only allow the agent to communicate inbound to the appliance and does not present network file shares as the target for backups. This type of strategy allows a device that is compromised by ransomware to quickly be restored to the effective data to a known good state. And finally, IT executives should focus on increasing the cybersecurity acumen of their organizations. This can be achieved by giving all IT staff a fundamental degree of cybersecurity competence. Everyone from the sysadmin to the tech support should have a role in security. Entry-level certifications such as Security Plus, GSEC, and SSCP help to reinforce the need for a secure approach to all IT operations and should not be limited to people focused or specialized on delivering cybersecurity. Greater cybersecurity acumen can also be achieved by increasing the number of certified security professionals in an organization. Cloud adoption, the increase in the number of remote workers, the increase in security attack vectors all necessitate more security knowledge. Who has a security strategy for the cloud? Who can properly classify data? Who can protect data? Who can track and monitor who has access to data? Who understands the differences in security governance? The answer is certified security professionals. Cybersecurity professionals understand the environment, they understand the challenges, and they understand the best practices and policies needed to effectively and efficiently manage the organization's data. The post-COVID world will require IT executives to rethink cybersecurity. Third, the post-COVID world will require IT executives to rethink remote work. The sudden move to a remote workforce created concerns about productivity, accountability, and security. Yet one month into that great experiment, management was surprised. The world did not come to an end. CEOs discovered the value and potential cost savings of a flexible remote workforce. More work was completed, which was consistent with an air tasker study that determined telecommuters worked 1.4 more days every month or 16.8 more days every year than people who worked in the office. Employees experienced greater job satisfaction and overall quality of life due to shorter commutes, flexible work schedules, and more time with the family. Employees also dreamed about the possible benefits of more affordable housing, lower taxes, and better weather that could accrue to remote or alternative work locations decoupled from expensive congested on-site work locations. Yet six months later, the great experiment is being seen a little more realistically. Let me group the challenges that remote work creates into five buckets. Costs. Remote work does not reduce costs as much as originally thought. Reduced office space for employees is nearly offset by the need for more collaboration space. Reduced furnishing costs are nearly offset by the need for more remote employee technology, equipment, tools, and software. 
New tools are needed to forecast financial and resource demands, and additional costs are incurred to deliver end user support services to a remote geographically dispersed workforce, particularly those requiring hands-on support such as hardware failures. Culture. Remote work complicates community building or corporate culture. It is more difficult to onboard, train, and immerse new employees into the corporate culture. It is more difficult to host social activities that help colleagues to get to know one another as individuals, for relationships to form, and to build a corporate culture. It is also possible for remote work to create two tiers of employees, those with access to senior management and those without such access. Creation. Remote work impacts creation. The decline in spontaneous interaction can negatively impact innovation. Career development. Remote work negatively impacts talent development. Younger professionals do not develop at the same rate as they would in offices sitting next to colleagues and absorbing how they do their jobs. It's also difficult to build teams when new employees have no personal access to veteran employees on the teams that they are assigned to. Collaboration. Remote work negatively impacts collaboration. Projects take longer. Teams physically building a product can't work side by side. Team members can't read body language or see signals that don't come through the screen. Spontaneous interactions are hampered. Remote work makes it difficult, if not impossible, for leaders to observe and foster the creation of employees, of relationships amongst their employees. These five types of challenges make it necessary for IT executives to rethink remote work. They need to re-engage with their staff. IT executives should serve their, their employees. They need to ask questions such as, do you feel confident that your organization will manage the return to work well? Do you feel confident that the leaders of your organization will consider all inputs from employees, managers, partners in the government when crafting their return to work process? Do you feel confident that you'll be able to attend to your personal responsibilities like child care and elder care? Do you feel confident in the future of your job at this organization? Asking questions such as these ensures that you are re-engaging with your staff. But it's also important to reconceptualize office space. The office should be viewed as an add-on to virtual work versus the default for where people work. Reconceptualizing the office should focus less on reducing office space though that is possible, and more on maximizing collaboration and community building space. Reconceptualizing the office means less work for individual work, means less space for individual work, and more space for hotel type seating, huddle rooms, conference rooms, and hubs. It also means that collaboration space should be equipped with tools and technology to enhance the collaboration experience. IT leaders need to reconceptualize remote work tools. We need to substantially increase investments in communication tools that provide for more clarity for employees, robust tools and technology to support remote work and collaboration, and secure tools and technology to support data protection. We need to reconceptualize remote work measurement. We need to establish the parameters of work for regular activities. We need to set standards for when people are available and how key performance indicators are reported and measured. We also need to establish clearly defined routines, daily huddles, weekly meetings, et cetera. The post-COVID world will require IT executives to rethink remote work. Fourth, the post-COVID world will require IT executives to rethink their workforce. The post-COVID world workforce will be impacted by three major 
trends. IT executives need to be prepared for the acceleration of the exodus from blue states. COVID is actually turbocharging the ongoing exodus of people from high tax, heavily regulated blue states to states that limit government spending and are more pro-business. IT executives also need to be prepared for a possible urban exodus, high taxes, burdensome regulation, high housing costs, and dysfunctional schools is leading social democrat Joel Kotkin to call this movement urban feudalism. Urban feudalism results when middle class families and businesses are driven out of urban centers, leaving a wealthy white and Asian overclass in a large and often struggling predominantly minority population. This trend is likely to accelerate if city officials concede to the demands for strict rent controls, reductions in public safety, and bans on single family housing. Demands such as that will inevitably result in a lower demand for commercial office space, the closing of retail businesses, and a shortfall in tax revenue. With less money coming into the coffers, these urban centers will be forced to lay off police officers, firemen, and teachers, which will decrease the attractiveness of the city for business purposes and further degrade the quality of work of people living there. IT executives need to rethink how the demand for flexibility will impact their workforce. The opportunity to re work remotely during the coronavirus crisis has led many to rethink whether they need to live so close to the office. The real estate firm Redfin found that up to half of all new post-pandemic telecommuters want to continue from home. A survey by Zillow found that 75% of Americans that have been working from home due to COVID-19 would prefer to telecommute at least half the time once the pandemic subsides. And 66% said they would consider moving if their job allowed them to continue telecommuting. A separate survey produced by Redfin found that 50% of respondents in cities like New York, Boston, San Francisco, and Seattle said they would consider moving out of the city if remote working becomes permanent. There are several benefits that accrue to IT executives who offer greater flexibility to their workforce. It increases the potential pool of employees that can be hired. The potential workforce is no longer limited to the immediate geographic area of the office. It improves the resiliency of one's workforce. One's entire workforce is unlikely to be affected by a single natural disaster, power outage, or riot. It enables IT executives in red states in non-urban centers to poach workers who are wanting to exodus from blue states and urban centers. And at the same time, this demand for flexibility creates some risk for IT executives because existing employees who have flexible work arrangements can always be lost to companies offering similar or even more flexible work arrangements. And IT executives will need to rethink the value of college degrees. Increasingly, our institutions of higher education are failing to prepare students for the workforce. I repeatedly talk to employers who are more interested in certification than degrees, hands-on work experience than degrees, and specialization than generalization. Would you rather hire a cybersecurity resource with one year of cybersecurity monitoring experience, six to eight industry certifications, and 30 hours of industry-led classroom instruction? Or do you want a cybersecurity graduate from a four-year program with no hands-on experience and no industry certifications? Or stated differently, how many of you would hire a graduate from this program? independent of whether they have an associate's degree, an undergraduate degree, 
or a master's degree. IT executives need to partner with OEMs and workforce development programs that will combine extensive hands-on experience with industry-recognized certifications. IT executives need to encourage the development of programs that generate data architects, cloud architects, network engineers, ISOs, and accessibility coordinators outside of higher education. IT executives need to rethink the need for college degrees. Given that the post-COVID world will be different than you expect, and that it might be here sooner than you expect, it is imperative that IT executives rethink shared services, cybersecurity, remote work, and their workforce. I hope that this presentation was timely, informative, and thought-provoking.